Hello, I'm Brandon Strzok, founder of the Hashtag Walkaway Campaign. A few weeks ago, I was thrilled beyond thrilled when I got a phone call from TV legend and superstar Roseanne Barr. She had been following the Walkaway Campaign and had found out about our upcoming Walkaway March on Washington and was interested in knowing more about what it was that we were doing and why. So Roseanne and I got into a conversation talking about our own individual walkaway stories and got to know each other a little bit better. We spoke about life, politics, culture, that infamous tweet, and everything that came after, including the pain and devastation she felt by being removed from her own show and being labeled a racist and a bigot. We talked about the Democratic Party and we talked about liberalism. And I told Roseanne that I was doing my own show on Monday nights at 10 p.m. called Walk Away with Brandon Strzok, where we could talk about all of these things. And I insisted that she sit down with me for an interview and let the world know how she was really feeling about all of these things, the way that she had let me know. I told her that this interview will not be like other interviews in the sense that she doesn't need to defend herself, she doesn't need to come on my show and apologize, and that I am making clear from the get-go that I support Roseanne that I have Roseanne's back. And the reason why is because I don't believe in throwing people away over a lie. Roseanne is not a racist. Roseanne is not a bigot. Roseanne is not a hateful person. And as we like to do so many times with the Walk Away campaign, we like to reclaim the narrative about who people are from the left and give the voice back to the people. And that's what I wanted to do with this interview with Roseanne to allow her true and authentic voice to be heard. This is the real Roseanne. Please enjoy this interview. Once upon a time, I was a liberal. I am now walking away. Ladies and gentlemen, it's such an honor, and and I'm so excited to have this next guest with me. This is somebody who I've just loved and admired since literally since I was a little kid, and and I'm super stoked that she's here on the show tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Roseanne. Roseanne, how are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to have you here. It's I'm amazing thrilled to be with you too. Thank you so much. Um, so speaking. I'm thrilled. I, I, I was, you thrilled me many times over the last few weeks. And the first time was when you called me on the phone several weeks ago to let me know that uh, you were aware of the walkaway campaign and how, and told me kind of your feelings about that. Um, how did you even hear about the campaign, Roseanne? Um, well, you know, just being on Twitter and following the people I follow, um, it shows up in my timeline and um, I've watched all the interviews of everybody involved in Walk Away, and I just was so excited. It's such the right thing at the right time. Well, that's how I feel, too. I mean, I, I, I even feel sort of like I'm in the right place at the right time because, uh, you know, doing this campaign has just been an incredible experience for me. And it's obviously something I never had experience with in the past but all of a sudden it's like i sort of put out this message that i think people wanted for a really long time because i think what we're finding is that people are very fed up with the democratic party and the tenets of liberalism how do you feel about that i i feel the same um it's not even liberalism because you know i have a lot of friends who are you know on that side of things but this is a, a kind of a takeover of the democrat party by um left-wing extremists it is yes and that's that's what really need people really need to know that because uh, if you if you see the things they say it has nothing to do with citizenry of this country or how to make the country better how to get jobs how to have unions how to have power to the people it's the exact opposite of that it's a lockdown a mental lockdown and uh it's uh you know, they uh, are using a lot of mind control techniques to get everybody afraid to stray or dissent. As I've always said, uh, you know, social media is um, kind of where uh, the narrative is formed and it's passed. It's like that's how mind control works. And, uh, you know, they manufacture consent, but they also manufacture dissent. And the dissent that, that they've manufactured in the name of, you know, social justice, it's not social justice at all. It's uh, Stalinism. And I'm very concerned for the world and our country that 
people are not seeing through that. But I, I know that more and more people are seeing through it every day. We just want to help give it a little bit more of a push in time for the midterms because it's so important that people uh, regain their freedom of thought. Um, it's the most important thing. And uh, and go out and vote, you know, this time vote Republican. I'm not a member of any party. And sometimes I've come out and said vote Democrat. You know, it, it depends on I feel like a vote is a way to correct the bad things that are going on that we don't like. And sometimes you have to vote from the left if it's gone too far right. And you have to vote from the right when it's gone too far left. Because I think that the extreme strength of the American people is in the middle. And most Americans are in the middle and they don't like either extreme left or right. I love everything that you just said. I agree with you completely because this is what we talk about a lot in the walkaway campaign is one thing I say is walkaway is a journey, not a destination. I don't tell people where to go. Now, what I happen to have found myself after doing months uh, going up, going on almost a year of research that I now find myself in the Republican Party, something I never would have thought would have happened. Same here. So yeah, before, I mean, if you had told me years ago I was going to be a Republican, I would have thought that so, uh, pod people had taken over and, you know, stolen my brain. But, it's, it, but, the, but you know, you kind of touched on something, Roseanne, and I've heard you say this before. Uh, I believe when you were on the Jimmy Kimmel show, you said, uh, and I couldn't agree more, I haven't changed. You all changed. And I mean, don't you think that's so true? This isn't about I, so many people like to say to me, and I'm sure they say to you, too. Oh, well, you've, you know, you're, you're embracing uh, racism, you're embracing bigotry, you're big my values have not changed. Right, I, I, exactly. I mean, I'm the same person. And I know that you're the same person too. It's, it's the values on the left that have changed and what they're pushing for. I can't be a part of it anymore. No, you, I don't think any moral person can be a part of it. No educated and informed person can be a part of it. Um, but you know, you're dealing with, mass mind control and they control the narrative and all and all of the main you know main mainstream media so you know if if you are and i you know there's a large number of people who are uh i hate to say too lazy but uh, they haven't made sure they haven't vetted the stories and and that's why i like q anonymous because q anon i mean because uh q is uh, trying to get us to vet every news story for ourselves, to do the research ourselves that's available, you know, that they haven't so far scrubbed from the internet. And believe me, I've been in this kind of same movement, although it, it's sort of mutated, but uh, they've scrubbed a lot of information off the internet and replaced it with, you can tell that it's just uh, the establishment. Everything is the establishment and people on the left that they don't know that they are mouthing what the establishment tells them is kind of sad because there's absolutely no dissent there. And that's the death of uh, the Democratic Party, in my opinion. I agree with you completely. And I, you know, you use this term several times, mind control. Now, I know exactly what you mean when you say that, because I've had my own red pill experience. I've had, I've walked away, but you know, for people I think who are still on the left, they hear a term like that and they kind of roll their eyes and say, Oh, conspiracy theorists, conspiracy theorists, mind control. What, what are you talking about when you say mind control? Well, I, I mean, if you want to make it simple, I'm, I'm talking about a narrative. Right. That's not based on fact. That's not vetted. That comes from a small you know, I hate to use the word cabal, but just a small group of people who want things to stay, stay the same. And uh, apparently they think everything was great till Trump got in there. So, right. you know, they think everything was great. You know, the fact that American Indians uh, were not allowed to vote till 1948. They have no problem with that. They right. have no problem with Jim Crow, I guess. They have no problem with, um, you know, classism per se in any way they had no problem with it till trump got in and right but, there that proves i always call it a left-wing conspiracy theory and it is it's a faux left-wing conspiracy theory 
And don't you feel that they've been particularly effective by, you know, I always say that I feel like what triggers uh, somebody on the left more than anything is social justice. People on the left love to feel like they are participating in righting a wrong. And it doesn't even matter to them whether what the, the perceived wrong is true or not true. No, uh, that's we'll proof of mind control right there. Uh, they, they do not care that it's in, unjust and immoral, and it is from top to bottom. Intersectionality is a complete Stalinist, can you, I swear. Absolutely. It's Stalinist bullshit to keep people from knowing the truth, of speaking the truth, of networking together to stop the oppression uh, of classism, in which of which racism is a symptom. Yes, and you use the you used the term earlier, uh, you, lazy, and I think you said sort of almost boarding on kind of complacent. But I think what happens is, you know, you were talking about how social media is sort of where the collective consciousness begins. It's so true. I mean, it literally takes nothing more than somebody sending out a tweet or something saying. So and so is a racist. So and so is a bigot. Boom! You've got the pack, the whole pack mentality. They will yeah. latch onto that and just chew somebody down to the bone and destroy them. Based and off what of they, what they never, what they fail to notice because they're under heavy duty mind control of the establishment. And believe me, the establishment knows about mind control. They know how to turn a phrase. It's beyond 1984 that they called Obamacare the Affordable Care Act when it's just the opposite. They know how to use words and uh, manufacture consent in their phony double speak. And, uh, you know, nobody is really talking about, so I want to talk about the anti Semitism of this Democratic Party. And it's, it's, that is a new thing over uh, the last. 10 years since I think since September 11th, 2001, they have the establishment and believe me, there's Republicans and Democrats in it, you know, and uh, they're really trying to lock down the way not only we see things, but the way we're allowed to discuss them. And uh, so there's no freedom of speech. Um, when Obama signed NDAA when he was in office, I said then on Twitter, this is the death of comedy. Yeah. Whole comedy, because, you know, now you are not allowed to say, just like any regular Stalinist government, when you say something that they think is offensive, they'll just ruin you. They don't think twice about it. Right. They but don't. They don't. They do it as fast as they can. It's a reflex. They got to shut it all down because people are not allowed to know or to discuss in this country the anti-Semitism of the Democratic Party. Right. You know? And uh, that's my walk away moment. And it was in 2012 when I ran uh, for uh, president and I was the candidate of the Peace and Freedom Party, which is a socialist party. And all my life I was a socialist. I'm also Jewish. And uh when I was addressing the delegates all across the country, which I did by Skype, because I wanted to have the first presidential candidacy that was all social media based. And I did. And uh, but when I would address those delegates in every state, these, these are socialists. Uh, and they would add, they would, you know, there'd be a portion where they and I ran on the. Uh, National on uh, nationalizing the Federal Reserve. That was one of my because I really put a lot of thoughts. I've always been very political and a political writer. And so, you know, I put all these things that those of us who really want to see change happen, real change. We already formulated all these ideas in the 60s, you know. But uh, when I would address the delegates and they were uh, it would come time for them to question me. Most of their questions almost always first was. Uh, about Israel, and it just really stuck in my craw. And it stuck in my craw big time in Florida because it was right around the time that Trayvon Martin was shot, and I wanted to address the Stand Your Ground drug uh, gun laws there. Mm -hmm. And um, they they wanted to hear about, they wanted to hear me condemn Israel. And, that, and I said, well, you know, I have family in Israel, and I'm a Jew, so I probably have a different idea than you. And also because it is, you know, in, in many ways, a socialist state, or was then. 
and uh, just their complete anti-Semitism and hatred of only one country on earth, the only Jewish one. It just started to melt me down. And uh, they, they didn't care about this country at all. They didn't care about the wrongs in this country. They didn't care about social justice in this party, in this country. They never wanted to discuss labor rights, which I was a socialist because it's about labor rights, you know. They didn't want to discuss anything but how uh, terrible Israel is. And any other country on earth you might have a problem with, like a lot of people have trouble with the United States. But they don't say all Americans need to be driven into the sea and the country destroyed. I mean, it's just so bigoted. And those are the people that took over the Green Party, the socialist movement, and moved into the Democratic Party. Because when they ran Bernie, they saw, I really think that the whole thing is that the Green Party and the and the uh, Democrat Party, they're going to join for 2020. Because and, you, nobody's voting Democrat too much anymore after everything that uh, the Democrat Party has been involved in. And the more that comes to light, the more people will walk away too. But it really is about globalism versus nationalism. And I don't mean the worst kind of nationalism, but, but that there would be nation states instead of one great big pool of slaves for people like Hillary Clinton to lord over. Right. Yes, absolutely. Now, I wanted to ask you when you so you ran for president in 2012. Yes. Right? So who did you vote for in 2008? Uh, did you vote well, for Obama? In 2008, I was for Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> I, I preferred her over Obama because he always scared me. And oh. uh, and then we had huge fights on the left over that. You know, they they pretty much booted me my ass out of there because I was saying, well, Hillary at least is for, you know, healthcare. She has, she has uh, some ideas of a uh, healthcare plan. And uh, I didn't think Obama did. And Obamacare proves that he didn't. And you know how I spell it? O-B-A-M-A-C-A-I-R. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, but I, I thought she was a better candidate than Obama. So that was kind of, That was the last person I was not allowed to vote for. Everybody I want for president, I'm never allowed to vote for. And I think people should give that a minute or two of thought. Let that sink in. You're you're never really allowed to vote for the person you really want as president. What do you what do you mean by that? Maybe this time, maybe this last 2016, people really did want Trump and he won. uh, You know, against all odds, because people wanted him that bad. My friend said. About uh, five years ago, he said, "He said, well, if if the American people want Trump, they'll get Trump." That's and right. And they wanted him that bad. Right. So in 2012, you ran. So how were you feeling about Obama by the time we were getting we were approaching 2012? What made you decide that you needed to run? Well, the first time that I heard that Obama had taken more. Um, contributions than any other candidate before him, including Hillary, so chew on that, but that his major supporter was the nuclear technology, you know, money. And I thought, my God, because I've always been for, uh, you know, getting rid of nukes, denuclearize, you know, as weapons anyway. And I thought, this is really bad that he is beholden to that group. And uh, I think, you know, he did he's like a used nuke salesman. And I, that's how I always thought of him. Okay. So I was reading on uh, Wikipedia here that you ended up, (laughs) I I preface that because I don't believe anything I read on Wikipedia. So I want to ask you about it. Uh, It says that you voted for Obama in 2012 after, of course, you didn't get the, the nomination for president. So is that, did you vote for Obama in 2012? I did because they took my name off the ballot and I wanted to vote for myself in Hawaii, my home state. And I I did all of it so that I could show my grandkids that, you know, you could get on the ballot if you had, uh, you know, you know, the right things that you need to get on the ballot. And uh, I wanted to vote for myself in Hawaii, you know, because to me, well, the other thing I learned is just how hard it is to get on the ballot. 
to get any law on the ballot that makes sense, that doesn't like, you know, serve the very worst of, you know, people. Right. And that's impossible too. And it took so many people for me to get my name on three ballots in three states. And that's all it came down to. So I was running against Obama. Of course, I never thought that I was going to beat him. But, uh, you know, because people aren't that smart. Right. Uh, but, uh, but um, you know, when it came down, I couldn't vote for Romney. Right. So uh, you wanted to make a statement. You're, 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 I wanted I wanted to make a movie about what it takes, and I did make a movie about how just uh, undemocratic and unfair our ballot is. Because you know it takes one billion dollars to lose an election in this country. So wow. Abraham Lincoln would never be able to run. Uh, you know, only uh, puppets of big money can run. That's right. And that's not good for any of us. Well, it's not because, I mean, essentially, it almost guarantees that by the time somebody gets into office, they're completely beholden to uh, these large entities and, and corporations and, you know, these entities that don't really represent what the American people want. Well, you know, I think it was Thomas Jefferson that said someday, you know, his greatest fear was that someday uh, business would control Congress rather than the other way. Right. And, you know, that's what we got. We got. uh we just have um, a government of lobbyists. Exactly. Exactly. So, I, so tell me, when did you feel like you? It, the anti-Semitism obviously was very eye-opening for you. But how did you get from that place in 2012, where you still voted for Obama, to voting for Trump? Or wait, 2016. I'm sorry, is what I meant. Uh, no, no, no. 2012, voting for Trump in 2016. How did well, we get to you know, that was four years of doing a lot of reading. And, uh, you know, it's hard to find real facts on the Internet. But if you look really, really hard and because I was on Twitter and I had so many followers, you know, uh, you know, they send me information and links. And I, I just I just kept reading and reading and reading. And I, I read declassified stuff, too. I, I don't just read newspapers. I read everything. Right. I read wide variety of opinion too which i think is very necessary because you know not a, not any party or people are all bad or all good you know it's 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 our government and we have to be informed about what's really going on that's why i love what you said about qAnon because you know that's another sort of you know for some people it's very controversial and they hear that and they think oh conspiracy theory conspiracy theory well the truth is despite how anybody feels really about QAnon in terms of substance, you're absolutely correct in what you said in that at the very least, it's gotten people to start doing their own research. Yeah, that's what's fantastic. Right. And understanding that there's so much more going on than what the mainstream media is telling us and the spin with which that information comes to us when we get it from the mainstream media. Yeah, they just want docile people. Right. They want, they want docile people that ha that are like their anger is simmering and they need a target for, and then they can come in and, and shape the narrative that makes you get out there and hurt people. And that, yeah. I think that's what it's all about. They're being, I, I've been saying it for years that I felt like the mentally ill were being activated. And, um, I still think that way. And, uh, you know, I tell, I would tell, especially young people don't go when they tell you to go stay home. Because they don't have your best interest. They just want you in their prison system, which they own. And, uh, you know, you're going to work for corporations for 16 cents an hour behind bars. That's their goal. And and that is their goal. And 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 uh, that was part of my campaign in 2012, too, about three strikes you're out and marijuana laws and the need to uh, legalize marijuana. Because using those drug laws that's where they got racial profiling and, uh, you know, sending kids to adult prisons and just locking us all down. They right. lock all our freedoms. And I can't believe that intelligent people will stand there and defend that. We'll defend Bill Clinton for signing that. They'll defend, you know, they'll defend the people who don't mean well for them because they've been told that uh, Trump is so terrible. But what about everything that happened in this country 
before Trump. That was okay. Right. Yeah. And I do think that Trump is a, you know, he's, he is somebody who can see a whole system and what needs to be changed in order to fix it. And that's why I liked him. I like that. I, the way I felt about Trump in when he announced was, oh my God, I'm so excited. This guy is going to destroy not only the Democratic Party, but the Republican Party too. And I think that's a good first step. He's created another party that's in the middle and is more to the way people in this country really think in the middle, the vast middle. Absolutely. It's that center again that we're, I think that we're trying to control that's away from the fringe left for sure, but also away from that swamp on the right that it's like right. w- that we need to get away from. And and I think this is kind of a, a, a perfect- I think it's important for us, for me to say those guys all golf together. They all work together. One might have a pin that says Republican and one might have one that says Democrat. But believe me, they're only in there to enrich themselves and their friends. They don't care about the American people. Nothing of the legislation till Trump uh, passed by them had anything to do with the voter. Absolutely. You know, Roseanne, I'd like to talk a little bit about your show because, you know, back in, uh, I, believe you pre- I believe you debuted in 1988. Does that sound correct? Yeah, at the, at, in, the, in the fall of 88. Right. And so uh, I remember, I'm a kid of the 80s. So I, you know, I remember vividly, I actually remember watching the debut episode of your show. And, but to give people a little bit of context, you know, I think uh, Reagan had just left office or was just about to leave office. Um, and in the 80s, what we had seen up until that point, the biggest hit shows on television were Dallas, Dynasty, The Cosby Show, you know, basically a lot of shows that were good and a lot of fun to watch, but really didn't represent the American people at all. These were about wealthy people living lavish lifestyles and not something that the average American citizen, I think, really identified with. And then all of a sudden, around 1988, came a show called Roseanne. And I recall vividly watching that premiere episode in my basement. My mom, see, we we were a very Connor kind of family. We were working middle class. Uh, Both of my parents are not college educated. My dad is a cattle rancher. Uh, My mom was his bookkeeper. We lived at a very modest house, very modest lifestyle. And I remember my mom ironing the clothes downstairs as we watched that episode of Roseanne. And she was just dying. I mean, she was just saying, this is great. This is great. And and it was, I mean, we, we all, I think for the first time, we're like, wow, this really is something that looks like my family. And I think that a lot of people felt that way for the first time. Well, they- I felt that way because I used to watch TV as a kid and think that very same way as you. And I, I always thought I was going to be on television or wanted to be. And I was like, when I'm on there, I'm going to show what it really, really is. But, you know, it was a difficult thing because they don't, I, I'm I'm fully convinced that still in television, they don't like people like us. They don't like their audience, and uh, they never wanted to have somebody who was of that audience on their stations. I that, and that's the truth. Right. Well, that's certainly gotten worse. I think in the climate that we're in today. Uh, because, you know, what's so interesting is there's that parallel there where the first time you came out with Roseanne in 1988, you gave a voice to the American people who weren't represented, who were finally seeing a representation of their lifestyle, their problems, the issues that concern them every day. They were seeing this for the first time. And it wasn't until the second iteration of Roseanne this year that it was the same thing all over again, finally. And it wasn't just a matter of the working class. Yes, it was the working class. And yes, it was that the Connors represented these problems. But let's be honest, we were finally seeing people who were a- expressing the voice of a Trump supporter on a television show. We've never seen that before. And, uh, and you know, you'll never see it again. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll never see it again. Now, before we talk, because uh, I want to kind of get into this, but I'd like to, if you don't mind, show a few clips from the show, Roseanne, and give them a little bit of context. Because I'd love that. We're going to do it because uh, we all know uh, about uh, the tweet, the Roseanne tweet. Uh, I talked to you on the phone, and one thing I told you is that um, we are not going to have you come on this show and have you defend yourself and have you plea for the American uh, people to forgive you and apologize. If you want to do that, that's fine. No, but I already a- did that. Yeah. I, I, I did w- that to everybody whose feelings were hurt or mi- who misunderstood me. But the fact is they did misunderstand it. And it's time for them to apologize to me. 
That's how I feel. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, because, you know, the thing is, I want to make very clear too. um, you know, I this isn't like a typical talk show. I'm not an objective journalist, obviously, but I want to be very clear going on the record as saying I support you, Roseanne. I have. Yeah, I have always supported you. And I think that what happened to you as a result of that tweet is despicable. And I think it's absolutely indicative of where the left is headed You know, right now, just absolutely beheading anybody who does anything that falls out of line with, as you say, their narrative, what they want. You expressed the voice of a Trump supporter through a character on television, and it was their mission to kill you. And we'll I get- think so. Now that I look back, I'm like, you know, I always, it was always going rough, but I ignored it because I... I felt love for the people I was working with at that time, you know, and I just didn't, it didn't occur to me that, you know, I mean, they begged me to come back and I, and they kept saying, oh, this time it'll be different. You'll be given the respect you were denied. You'll be given, we have your back. Let me tell you, when you hear that term in Hollywood, run for your life. (laughs) Good advice. Yeah. Let's take a look at these clips because I want to give a little context and say that since the since your tweet came out, you have been branded a bigot. You've been branded a racist. Uh, you've been branded a hater, a hateful person. And so let's let's take a look at and let's make very clear to people too. something that's always been different about the Roseanne sitcom is that. Roseanne was not an, uh, an actress who showed up for work every week and read the lines that were given to her and then clocked out and went home. Yeah, she wrote them. Yeah, she wrote them. And that show was always very much your voice. I mean, that you didn't say lines that you didn't believe in. No. I, well, no. I did this time a couple times. And it was funny. I'll, we can go into that later. Okay. Uh, what happened. All right. It's so all let, like, when I look back now, it's like, oh, I see what happened. Yeah. But I so, didn't then. Let's take a look at a couple of clips. And I'd like to say, before we take a look at the first clip, which is from 1992. So let's give a little context. Uh, Bill Clinton was the president in 1996. And uh, in 1996, Bill Clinton signed the Defense of Marriage Act, which essentially put gay people as second class citizens, denied us over 1000 marital rights. And Hillary Clinton, uh, people can take a look. There's numerous interviews with Hillary Clinton, who's a huge hero of the left. Uh, actually laughing many times when giving interviews saying that she does not believe that marriage should be, uh, that gay people have the right to get married. It's a sacred right. institute only between a man and a woman that she's against uh, gay marriage and other gay rights, a th- over a thousand rights that go along with gay marriage. This is what Roseanne was saying four years before that in 1992. Rob, can we take a look at that first clip? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, have you ever seen Mr. Carp take any cash from the register? Oh, well, yeah. Because he does the books, you know, that's his job. Uh, Have you observed any changes in his normal routine? No. Have you seen him exhibit any unusual behavior? Oh, I know what this is all about. You're trying to scrounge up some dirt on Leon just because he's gay. Well, I ought to call the ACLU because this is totally un-American. And I'm not going to give you any help in your little witch hunt. No crappy job is worth that. And the next clip, and the next clip that we're going to take a look at is from 1994. And just to give you a little context, uh, Clinton was uh, still president in 1994. And uh, that was the year that he signed the crime bill, which resulted in mass incarceration of African Americans. We saw one more- in three African American males is in uh, the penitentiary in this country. Absolutely ravaged uh, African American families and their homes, and this was also his wife, uh, hero of the left, Hillary Clinton, had uh, re- uh, referred to these uh, African Americans as super predators. Now, yes, and you what- can see why. Uh, I'll I'll jump in right here and say you can see why I now say I reject, I reject, I reject the left's definition of what racism is. Absolutely. That's without class analysis of which they never offer anything because they're all rich. <laughs> um, but, Roseanne, let's take a look real quick at what you okay. were saying in 1994. Well, I'm the- just saying I don't accept their definition of me as a racist. I don't accept it. So let's move on now. Let's take a look at that clip. No matter what it is, you can tell us. Is it because she's black? It is, isn't it? Well, you'll be mad if I say yes. No, we won't. Yes, we will. <laughs> I didn't raise you to be some little bigot. 
I just don't want to kiss her. Hey, black people are just like us. They're every bit as good as us, and any people who don't think so is just a bunch of banjo-picking, cousin-dating, barefoot <laughs> embarrassments to respectable white trash like us. DJ, if you don't want to kiss this girl, your mom and I won't force you to. Hey, you're kissing that girl. You're doing the play, and that's all there is to it. Well, Dad said I didn't have to, and Dad outranged you. <laughs> Are you new? <laughs> oh, I love that so, so much. So that's and where And you we... know, in the reboot, uh, DJ marries that girl. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. And you have a, a black grandchild on the show. Yeah. Now, when, Roseanne, I, when that when your tweet came out that night, uh, my, a friend of mine uh, texted me and he said, "Did you see what's going on with Roseanne?" So I jumped on and, and and I started to see you know racist tweet, racist tweet. So I I ran to your Twitter page and I read it and I was look I was like, which what are they talking about? Which one? Like I was scrolling through and I and I was like, that that th this is the tweet that and that got her pulled off her show and and that the whole world is uh, on fire about. I mean. Now, I think you would probably agree it's not the nicest tweet you've ever sent, maybe? Well, I mean, it's not one of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. I express my opinion on Twitter because I mistakenly thought that that was a place for free speech. And, of course, we all know now that it isn't. Well, it but, is. You know, you I was, uh, my tweet was about um, the Iran deal and... Uh, uh, you know, I had been talking about that for weeks on Twitter. So, you know, when you take uh, conversations with many people that are weeks long and pick one out, you know, something's up. Well, but we had already been talking about Valerie Jarrett as the author of the Iran deal and what the Iran deal meant to Israelis and to American Jewry and to worldwide Jews. And uh, we weren't happy about it. And that was what I was expressing. Uh, just, it was uh, a, it was a, it was a, you know, when I, when I wrote it, I thought, oh, this is really going to be good. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is really going to wake people up as to, you know, the, the whole thing that's happening in Iran, because there's a people's revolution going on there. And the, our mainstream media never, ever mentions it. They, they take any criticism of the Obama administration as cause for censorship. And their reactions to things are just so basic at this point. I mean, it's like any excuse that they can find to call it racism, homophobia, transphobia, whatever. And then it's you're just done. You're cooked. And, it, and I get where is the voice of you had the number one show. I mean, that, uh, what was it? More than 20 million viewers watched this new iteration. 28 iteration. million. 28 and, million. And then, uh, you know, like I say, you know, it, it wasn't, now that I see their thinking and what happened to me all along, that I wasn't really being conscious of because I was working so hard. Uh, no, they they probably never wanted my show at all uh but bob Iger wanted it and he kind of forced abc abc's uh president to take it and i don't think she ever wanted it and um and that's clear to me now looking back you know so i was always in a tough position there so now we know that the show is coming back without you uh yeah. what's what's going to happen to roseanne connor oh they killed her they killed her. Yeah. They uh, had her die of an opium or an opioid overdose. So it wasn't enough to just do what they did to me. They they had to so cruelly uh, insult the people who loved that family in that show. They had to cruelly insult them. And that's what they chose to do. So there's nothing I can do about it. It's done. It's over. There's no fight left. I did what I had to do to save my own life, and I did it. Don't you feel, or do you feel, like the way that they've written your character out is a message that's being sent to the American people? Killing Roseanne, killing a Trump supporter. What do you think? Yeah. Do you think there's a symbolism there? I do, kind of. Do you? <laughs> yeah, I think big time. I think that it's, it's a... I, it's a 
uh, ominous, I think, warning to a certain degree that they're giving us. Look what happens if you if this is how you th- if you think wrong. Right, I think so. Yeah, we'll we'll ruin you. We'll um, libel you. We'll take your life's work. Um, and you know, I'm I'm really surprised that many more comedians haven't uh, defended me because they have to know as as do uh, all artists who work in the medium of television that with one tweet that they misinterpret, mis- mischaracterize, and uh, fixate on, um, they'll take your work. Well, and, and, but let's be real. I, I mean, we're seeing these these performers all the time say the most outrageous things, much worse than anything that you said. But if it's a leftist point of view, uh, they laugh, they cheer, they'll get on the, the late night talk shows, they'll revisit it there. I mean, it's... T- well, that's mind control. Yes. Yeah. And it's a mind control that manifests itself as a double standard. And, uh, you right. know, but... Right. But the left does not... The, the worst fear of all fascists is dialogue. That, that's why I wanted to come back to do my show at the time I came back to do it, because I wanted to show that, you know, dialogue is, that's real. That's what people do. There are, pe- there are families all across America who voted for both candidates and have disagreements, but they don't try to destroy each other. They just find common ground, come back together and continue on the work of improving things. And that was why I thought, oh, this is such a great time for that message in our country and uh you know i think the numbers prove that it was and that people yeah. agreed with it yeah the the numbers definitely prove that it was and as we just said i think that killing that character in a way what they're saying is that they're killing that voice they're yeah. killing the voice of the american people the 28 million people were tuning in to to see and hear their own voice being represented and they're saying nope we're not going to do that anymore now you said that you did say some words in this new iteration that maybe weren't your voice. Do you want to talk about that at all? Oh, I mean, if I ever talk about the whole thing, um, I do want to talk about it, but I'll try to do it briefly. The first thing was that the first thing where I felt um, that I was up against something huge was uh, the first time that we did a uh, press event for ABC for the show. And they had the whole family come out. We sat on the couch and, you know, we we were told that we were going to uh, answer questions about the show. Right. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to be out there alone because I knew it would all be about me and, you know, things I'd said about the election. Well, so now the same presidents that canceled me were standing there and we're talking about presidents of a big network that at any point can step forward to go. We don't really like this line of questioning. We're here to discuss our new show. But they never did. And the first, it seems so coordinated now. The first questions, the first five questions were from African-American journalists. And this was the first question, one through five, all five of them. How can you, who were this uh, person who was, you know, against racism, against homophobia and all the isms, you know, somebody who stood for justice, how could you now embrace racism and a racist president? And I would say, well, that's your opinion and I don't agree with you. So then then he'd sit down and then the next and stand up and say the very same thing. And the presidents of ABC could have said, let's move on to talk about the show. And John Goodman said, they're trying to crucify you. And finally, and and my fellow cast member, the other producers said, don't say anything, don't say anything. So I didn't. I just said, well, that's your opinion. You're entitled to it. But by the fifth time, I was very angry. And this woman that was a woman, and she said all that, too, about racism. And I, I said then, and I think this really made them angry, because anytime you express an alternative view to leftists, they get angry. Yes. But I said, I, I said, racism, the reason I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton is because of Haiti. Do you know anything about Haiti? If you're talking about racism, and they became irate, and they just stood there giving me their evil eye the whole time. And uh, then they started asking about the show. What's it like to be back together after 20 years? But I feel like afterward, that was kind of coordinated. It was too perfect. 
not to be coordinated. And then they came to me and they wanted me to say this line. And it was Thursday and I'd been asking for, uh, you know, I, I like my writers to work. And I don't really like any more to uh, have to write my own lines if I have good ones from people that are making millions off me. <laughs> no. Yeah. So I don't want to do their job. So I said, well, I needed a joke here. And they brought down a joke. And I said, oh, I don't think this is the right joke. And it was uh, a joke about other shows on ABC, other working class shows. And I said, I, I think this is insulting. And they said, no, it's about all working class people support all other ones, Asian, black, you know, you've got to show that. And so I just let myself be talked into it. So I said it. Two days later, the New York Times comes out and uses that joke saying, this is the racism that the Roseanne show is about. And I didn't write that. And, uh, you know, my my instincts were right. I I was right. It was insulting. But the president of ABC defended that that joke in a big article the next day, of course, saying, uh, well, the she defended the writers, not me. She defended the people who wrote the joke and not me. So I was getting slime there double. And then, you know, there were a few other things like that that happened along the way to my tweet. And that morning of the tweet, it was Memorial Day. And already I had sent my favorite writers from the original show to interview to get back on this show because I felt like, oh, it would be fun to have people who really know these characters. They were all rejected. All the black writers I sent were rejected. All the Hispanic writers that I personally searched for and sent, they rejected. And that day I called and said, when, when are we all going to start writing? When, you know, because every idea of that whole reboot is mine that I had 20 years to think about. When I called that day on Memorial Day saying, when are we all, when, when are the writer's room? When does that start up? And he said, oh, we've already started. And I just felt my brain crumble and he goes but oh we would love so much for you to drop in and say hello wow and so i knew i had already lost control i knew i had lost control of my show and so maybe that had something to do with me blowing it all up in that tweet i was so angry and i was so unsettled and i felt like oh my god i didn't even see this coming and the whole time, you know, I had had Sarah Gilbert in there to be, I said, I will only come back if you talk to the network and I don't have to because I can't understand the things they say because they're, they're just gobbledygook corporate crap. And I, I don't speak that language by choice because I, I prefer speak as a creator. Right. And, uh, you know, I thanked her many times. And uh, one time in particular, I said, um, you probably have to go there and say the terrible things I say about them on stage here, you know, about, ah, oh, they don't know what they're talking about and stuff like that. You know, when we were rewriting. Yeah. And, uh, Cause guys would go, Oh, well, they aren't going to let that go. I go, yeah, they will. They'll let it go. They, you just put it this way. Cause they, they don't know what they're doing. And uh, she said to me, yeah. And I, I take, I take that same message from the network about you. And that was very unsettling too. Cause I was like, wait, so you're doing what the other writers did last time I worked, blaming all the problems on the star because they don't have the strength of character to say, we disagree. Uh, they go, oh, yeah, that's just her. She's all, you know, you know, I know what they do because I have people on the other side, too. Don't think I don't have spies. Been in show business 30 some years. I have spies. Trust me. And they're high level spies, too. But uh, putting it all together, it was like they never I don't think they ever really wanted me to come back. They just wanted they wanted that show and me to do what I was told. And as I've said from the beginning, I'm not that girl. You need to no. hire somebody else. <laughs> Roseanne has never been that girl. Uh, no. Yeah. You know, and that's what we love about you, Roseanne. <laughs> I mean, that's one of many things that I think people love about you is that you you really have always been a fighter. Uh, you've always been a survivor. Yeah. You 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 kind of have that lion's heart that I think that so many people identify with. And and 
it's, it's, you were a voice for so many people who didn't have a voice. And I think that they felt so much love for you because they knew that you would fight for them. And, well, they didn't want they didn't want me to have a, a, a multiracial family, and they didn't want me to have a, a son that was in the military, and because they didn't want anything about veterans either. And you know, I've been living a real life since I went off TV. You know, I've been farming and stuff like that, and just living a real life with my family. And of course, that's when you're a farmer. That's what you see. That's that's who you're hanging out with and your neighbors and people who've lost children. And I just thought that was the strength of the strength of spirit and the strength of character of the American people that I've always tried to put on television and, and to honor so that for once when people watch TV, they go, this makes me feel good about me and who I am and my family. We yes. don't wear designer clothes and we don't this and that, but we are the salt of the earth. And they don't think we're the salt of the earth. And, you know, I'm very upset because I feel like they insulted my audience, too, for every everybody who doesn't hate Trump's guts. Right. They insulted all of us. Well, and they uh, they insulted stupid. me in order to insult them. I was just the tool they used to yes. knock them down. Yes. You were the proxy. You were the vessel. You were. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the. You, the show was starting to develop a storyline there, I think, around the finale where it appeared that Roseanne was possibly going to have an opioid addiction issue or something was going on there. Now, we know well, we, we had we had that show. I wanted to do that. That was, of course, my idea, too. But, you know, because there's so many people my age, it, it's a real problem in America. Yes. And so we wanted to address things so that were real. And, uh, you know, I had had knee surgery and I took a lot of pain pills, too. And, uh, you know, that was three years ago. But, um, uh, you know, I have to say there there was a bit of a fight for me to quit and get off it, too. So I wanted to put that into the show. But I never was going to uh, have Roseanne Connor die of an opioid overdose. It's so right. cynical and horrible. Yeah. I mean, she, she should have died as a hero. Yeah. Or she not really at all. wanted to kill me off. Yeah. Or not at all. Yeah. But, you know, that uh, Channing Dung, uh, Dungy on um, she told she told Tom Warner, the producer of the Roseanne show, that um, that that he, there would be no way I could have any contact with my own creation, mm -hmm. any word about it, any say about it or they wouldn't do it. So they went far beyond just firing me. Yeah. Can I ask you about, uh, if I may, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to, uh, in terms of your your castmates, do you feel betrayed? Um, here's how I feel, and this is very honest. I, I feel that they all lost a really good friend. That's it. Okay. Okay. Why don't we uh, switch gears, because I don't want to take your whole day up, but I do want to talk a little bit about the March on Washington. Please, I'm so excited. Yes. So for uh, anyone who may not know, the walkaway campaign is uh, having a walkaway march on Washington. And uh, it's perfectly in keeping with what we're talking about, because after I started the campaign, it sort of exploded. And the left wing media decided to try to steal the voices of real Americans who, for you know, the first time were kind of stepping up and finding their voice. I say that, you know, the silent majority was becoming unsilent is becoming unsilent. But well, the they left did it to the Tea Party, too. Don't forget. Yeah. They, they infiltrated and effed that up. Well, so, what, they're, you know. what they've tried to do is say that the walkway campaign is Russian bots, Russian propaganda, fake actors, uh, paid actors, uh, stolen images from Shutterstock. Anything to try to invalidate the, the, the validity and the legitimacy of these real people who are stepping up to, to tell their stories and say they're not going to take it anymore. They don't want what's going on with the left. They don't want what's going on with the Democratic Party. So I said, OK, if the left wing media wants to pretend like these people don't exist and wants to use their power as a sword to hold over them and invalidate them, we're going to give the power back to the people. And I decided to have a walk away march on Washington. This is October 26th through the 28th. The march and the rally itself are on October 27th. That's Saturday. We are going to get 
I hope tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people to collect. Uh, we are going to, be, going to be marching from the DNC to our nation's capital, a stunning backdrop in front of the Capitol. We're going to have an amazing rally and speakers. Roseanne, it's going to be an incredible, incredible experience. And I think it's going to be very powerful going into the midterms. What do you think about it? I think it, it has the potential to be the most powerful thing that's ever been said by people like us who are uh, loving people who don't want to see our country uh, sold out to the highest bidders who actually hate our guts and hate our constitution um, uh, and, hate, and hate women and hate gays and hate Jews and hate black people who are conservative and hate, 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 hate. Well, That's hate the mind control of hate. And I just... Pray. I'm going to be praying, and I have been praying. I'm praying all the time for people to just listen, show up, get off that uh, plantation, you know, walk away from Egypt into, uh, you know, a whole new land where we can remake everything. There's nothing we can't solve. Once we turn off the mind control and get our free thinking back, our facts, our data, and reality and speak to each other with human dignity. That's it. That's it. Exactly. You know, is there a message that you would like to send? I know you and I have spoken on the phone and you, you've told me a lot about where your heart is and that you're, you're very concerned about the Jewish community. I mean, there's so many communities that we're concerned about, but is there a message specifically for the Jewish community that you'd like to say in terms of what the Democratic Party is about or the leftists are about? Anything that you'd like to say in terms of a walk away message? Well, community. yeah, you know how um, Candace Owens and people talk about the Democratic plantation and getting free of it. First of all, I want to say I'm so proud of her and of, of all African-American and uh, Hispanic people that are walking away from that little tiny box they want you in that never to fix, never to correct, but just to stay there so they can go, you know, they, they can point at you, you know, so they get richer. But uh, so I'm very proud of them. And, uh, you know, I'm just so happy for them. And I wish that for Jewish people, too, in the Democratic Party, because they're still uh, they're still under intense mind control there. And it's all been turned around on them. And I just hope for the added awareness they get of how their being Democrats is um, hurting uh Jewish, other Jewish people all through the world, and they need to be aware, be aware and walk away from the democratic ghetto. That's such a good point. That's such a good point. You know, I did a little research and I saw that uh, on average, Jewish people have voted Democrat at rates of about 75% for well over 20 years, uh, possibly more than that. And, uh, and that, you know what that got us? That got us the Iran deal where Jewish people who escaped Europe for safety after a Holocaust, after a genocide, are now being threatened with genocide daily by the uh, mullahs in, in Iran. That's what the Iran deal got the Jewish people and the Jewish Democrats of America. Right. That's not good. It's not good. And, you know, Roseanne, I, the reason why I have now found myself over on the right as a Republican is because, number one, I truly feel that the Republican Party has changed. I think it's yes. becoming more open and inclusive and diverse. I mean, we're... Like you just said, African-American support for our president has gone from 15 percent to over 35 percent in just one year, which is outstanding. I mean, and, and nobody's trying to tell these people, go away. We don't want you. Everyone's saying, no, please come over here where you can find personal empowerment, where you can find a message that says that we're we're all Americans. We're not divided. We're not splintered, but that it's all about taking control of your life. It's all about personal empowerment. You're not a victim. You're not a victim. Right. You are an American who has the power and the ability to be what you want to be and do what you want to do. And what's so great about America, it, it is that, I mean, in our collective unconscious anyway, that this was the great melting pot where people of diverse uh, looks and nations, but let's also remember, diverse opinion is what built America, plus yeah. a lot of slavery. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, diverse opinion has carried it forward. And it needs to continue to go forward. And the only way we can do that is by speaking to each other and coming up with a new plan. One group of people of a certain skin tone cannot make a plan for the rest of America. It has to be all voices and we have to all agree. And 
it's not that hard to talk or agree. I mean, I tried to show that on my show. It's right. not that hard. We have more in common than we have not in common. We just have to focus in on that and see how, you know, uh, by dividing us, they have conquered us. That's right. That's absolutely right. As a closing statement, Roseanne, is there anything that you would like to tell the audience that you would suggest for anybody who maybe has been feeling comfortable for a while in the Democratic Party and has been feeling like, whether you want to call it liberalism, leftism, progressivism, whatever you want to call it, but who are feeling like something is not right here. Something is, uh, and I don't know what to do because I feel like all my my friends and my family and my, my, my coworkers expect me to think like they think, but something's not right here. What would you tell them? I, I just, you know, there's a lot I would tell them. Just continue to read and re read a wide variety of sources, not just one opinion. Get a lot of different opinions. Think for yourself. And I think the biggest thing I would say is let freedom ring. Let it ring. Let it ring off everything. And that starts with uh, freedom of information. Absolutely. I love it so much. And, and, and you know what? You're not alone. To all of those people, you're not alone. There are many other people who are feeling the same way you're feeling. And with something like the Walkway campaign, you can find a whole network of support of other people who, like you, want something better and don't want to be a and part of it. it's very life. fresh. It's very fresh. You're not going to hear a bunch of old, tired rhetoric in this movement. Oh, You're no. going to hear, what can we do? You're going to hear that for the first time maybe in years. What yeah. can we do together to help our fellow Americans. I mean, it like goes back to Kennedy. That's not what your country could do for you, but what you could do for your country. You can walk away. You can walk away from mind control and bigotry and Stalinism. We want freedom. We want freedom. Yes, we do. We do. Roseanne. I love you and, uh, you know, all your work. I'm so glad you're there. And thanks for having me on your show. Roseanne, I love you too. And I, I look for, I, I hope that we continue this relationship for a long, long time because it's been just amazing having you in my life. We and and for me, you as well. Thank you, Roseanne. Love you, and uh, we'll be talking Love soon. You, honey. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.